Welcome back, everyone. Peter Maravellis here. This is the third session of today's symposium workshop titled Media and Us. The name of this session is titled Engaging Teachers and Young People. It will feature Allison Butler, Ben Boyington, Raina Robinson, and Kate Horgan. As is customary before each session, I'd like to acknowledge that we are beaming to you from the unceded ancestral grounds of the Ramatish Ohlone peoples, also known as the San Francisco Bay Area. I'd like to take this moment to honor those who have come before us as stewards of the land. A word about our participants before this session. Uh, Allison Butler is a senior lecturer and director of undergraduate advising and a director of media literacy certification program in the Department of Communication at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, where she teaches courses on critical media literacy and representations of education in the media. Ben Boyington is an advocate for integrating critical media literacy into K through 12 schools, a high school educator and member of the Media Freedom Foundation Board and former vice president of the Action Coalition for Media Education. Raina Robinson is a coordinator for services of San Francisco Bay Area Justice involved youth since 2016 and is a certified community resiliency model and youth mental health first aid instructor vice chair of the Museum of Children's Art and founder of the Center for Urban Excellence. Kate Horgan is an undergraduate student and researcher in the Commonwealth Honors College at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, studying communication and psychology with a certificate in media literacy. She is currently a news operator at radio station WMUA-FM in Massachusetts, where she orchestrates daily news broadcasts and audio features for their podcast. We have posted more extensive bios for our authors on the City Lights website. So if you want to learn more, uh, we've included links in the chat of the Zoom dashboard, and uh, as well as links to learn more about Project Censored and their uh, website. And I'm also uh, creating links to Media and Me if you want to learn more about the book that inspired these sessions. All of today's sessions are intended to be interactive. So we do encourage you from the get-go, please do communicate <laughs> with each other and with our participants. Uh, via the chat. Also, I want to remind everyone, all of today's sessions will be posted on YouTube. So if you miss anything, you'll be able to go back and view it at your leisure. All of the YouTube videos will also feature closed caption for those who need it. We regret not having real-time captioning at the moment, uh, but each session will be made available through YouTube. So please join us now in welcoming our session leaders, Allison Butler, Ben Boyington, Raina Robinson, and Kate Horgan. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Thanks so much, Peter. Thank you. Uh, so the topic of this session is engaging teachers and young people. So we would like to kind of do just that by telling you a little bit about our book, uh, The Media and Me. We talked about it at the opening session, and I see a lot of familiar names. So um, hopefully we can just sort of dive right in. But also specifically in this, um, the way in which we want this text and our work more broadly to speak with and to teachers and students, that there's a real sort of practical lived experience element of this work. Uh, one of the things that I shared at the opening session was uh, a new course out of um, Oak Meadow, which is based in Vermont. It's a critical media literacy course. Uh, Oak Meadow is a distance learning school. They provide curriculum for homeschool students, uh, both individual courses as well as full enrollment from what we might consider in a more traditional schooling system, a kind of K through 12 education. Uh, the grounding text for that class, um, which by the way, was built by me and with much help from Kate, um, who's also on this panel, uh, we're using the Media and Me as the grounding text for that course. We're also using Nolan Higdon's uh, Anatomy of Fake News for the discussions in that course on journalism. Um, and I bring that up um, not just to show off, although quite frankly, I'm really excited because this course <laughs> just dropped, they just finished build, like it just finished from the printers. My uh, So it just, it just showed up the other day. So I'm super excited about it in that capacity. Um, but also to, to really emphasize the, the practicality of how we intend this work, right? Um, some of us who are the authors of this text are uh, university educators, which can sometimes feel a little bit distanced from being practical. Um, it can feel a little bit more uh, just sort of like the work of the mind and the work of ideas, which is always incredibly important, of course. But what we really want to do and want to do with this book is have it be something that can be used by young people, either on their own time or in their classrooms, have it be something adopted by teachers for classroom use, have it be something adopted in community organizations and in libraries, 
Uh, and I think the members of this panel in particular tend to do a lot of that practical work. Um, and I'll leave it to them uh, to share some of that, but just some creative ways of different, uh, you know, creative and different ways of thinking about doing this. Um, certainly uh, nearest and dearest to, to my heart is Kate, who is working on her senior thesis right now, bringing in, um, uh, doing her senior thesis on uh, censorship, um, gender or patriarchy, excuse me, as a form of censorship. And it's going to be a really important traditional paper, but it's also going to have an interactive element to the thesis, right? Um, Raina does such great work in uh, the the Oakland area with system-involved youth. And I think, Raina, pretty much daily about a conversation that you and I had in October, um, where you said to me that you, one of your real emphases with your work is uh, having young people sort of be able to talk about what is happening positively in their worlds, right? It's so easy these days to talk negatively, uh, and that Reina is working with populations of young people who have significant and undeniable trauma, and she's helping them be able to see the sort of positive of their work really in practical steps. Ben Boyington is, um, has been a high school classroom teacher and now works with students um, on some of their more independent self-directed learning. Again, a real sort of practical place for integrating this work. Collectively, Ben and I have worked together um, with our colleagues colleague and friend Nolan in bringing media literacy work to high school, uh, or excuse me, not high school, I apologize, to K through 12 English teachers and librarians. Um, I've worked predominantly in Massachusetts, but elsewhere in bringing teacher training to media literacy. I give all of our accolades as a way of saying, we really want to walk this talk. We want this book to walk this talk. We want to be able to have this be real practical work. One of the things I mentioned in the opening session is that we want this to be a book that is really dog-eared and worn out because people are using it um, in, in really productive ways, making it, adapting it to be their own. Uh, and so part of our work in this panel, and I'm going to turn it over to my collaborators here in just a moment to talk about their work specifically, uh, but also, like I said, and have repeated multiple times is this is meant to be practical. It is meant to be used on a regular basis. Um, it is meant to be accessible and it is meant to not add more work to our teachers' plates, but as a way of them infusing and integrating uh, their work. Um, so I'm gonna do what I did in the previous session, which is to just sort of look at my camera and kind of go, or look at my screen, excuse me, and sort of go to, to who's next. Um, and I see Kate is somewhat next to me on this screen, next to, next to the City Lights wall of books, which I absolutely adore, um, is Kate. And Kate, I wonder if you could share with us a little bit about both your work on this text and then how um, how you're sort of seeing your your thesis come out of this a little bit and the ways in which you're doing a lot of practical work in your thesis. Yeah, thank you so much, Allison. Um, so in terms of the text specifically, I worked predominantly with the representation chapter, um, talking about how representations online and in media texts really shape young people's understandings of themselves uh, and the world around them. Um, as Alison brought up, this um, the focus of my thesis is patriarchy as censorship, predominantly in understanding how the media acts to um, both conceal and reinforce patriarchal censorship um, against women, specifically women of color, trans women. Um, and really, through this book, it's it's allowed me to have a, a almost inescapable critical media literacy uh, lens on how I see these things in terms of bringing out elements of production and audience and representation. Um, I always kind of, you know, joke with my friends and family because after reading this book, it's, um, I always kind of bring up the, the critical media side of looking at all sorts of different media things that we um, talk about and consume. And I think that's a really important and special part of this book is that I hope it'll encourage conversations for young people to have with amongst themselves, um, which is hugely important, not just to have with their teachers, but amongst their peers um, and seeing how these things translate into their um, into their everyday media use um, and the things that they see around them. So I've 
I've definitely been cemented with a critical media literacy outlook on both my my studies and how I uh, interact with my cohorts. So I'm very thankful for the book for doing that and the authors and the work that we've done here. And I really hope that this will be the same for the readers and consumers of it. Thanks so much, Kate. Uh, let's see, next on my screen is is Ben. Go for it, Ben. Thanks, Allison. Um, my primary role, I took lead on the advertising and consumerism chapter. Um, but I want to sort of yeah, sort of give kudos to everybody because I learned a lot by reading the other chapters and uh, getting that insight from people with, you know, experience in areas that I don't have. Um, as Allison said, I'm a high school educator. I piloted a uh, media course, media studies course. I called it Power in Media in, uh, I don't know, 2008, I think, at the high school I then worked at in Vermont. Um, I joked at the time with my colleagues, but it wasn't really a joke, that my hope was that the class would become unnecessary because it would get integrated across you know, the, the curricula as I think it should be. And that's sort of playing on something Allison said in the introduction as well, um, the earlier today. And I really think like the way I ended up doing that course, um, it, you know, it's a critical thinking reality, of course, all education should be. But I mean, the way that I ended up doing it, we integrated uh, English language arts, social studies, psychology, sociology, economics, you know, it was all in there. I'm not an expert in any of those things. Uh, well, ELA, I guess. Uh, that's my license, you know. Um, but it really was about getting students to question, to tapping into their sort of, uh, as, as I think Mickey said earlier, the innate BS meter of, of young people uh, in particular, and sort of exposing them to, you know, the manipulation that's going on. And not with that cynical, to go back to the discussion we had earlier about cynicism versus skepticism, not with the cynical eye, because I think that, you know, cynicism ends the conversation and skepticism opens up or sparks conversation. It's an important distinction. And when you show students that they're being manipulated, uh, they're in, you know, it's a, it's a great grab. And of course there are other ways, but that's, that's one I found really, really powerful. And in that work, um, I really tried to, by the time I was sort of near the end of that work and I was leaving that school, um, I was working on this concept of, I had been working for a few years by then, this concept of going from consumer, having the students write an arc for them of going from consumer to critic to activist. And I think that's really powerful. And we can play with that language of what activism means, but the idea was that they would have enough knowledge uh, with not only the media, but knowledge of media tools and production. I think that's essential when you do, especially high school level uh, media work um, to give the students opportunity to create. But they would have enough uh, knowledge and use of media tools to be able to do something with it, to, to sort of investigate and speak to uh, an, an issue that mattered to them from our media work. So that kind of informs my, my entire approach. Um, I have not in the, in the sort of um, this, this facilitator of uh, self-directed learning role that I now play, um, you know, it's coming out of student interest. So I'm edging up to with one student uh, getting into media and um, because we're talking about bread and circuses in ancient Rome and I'm and hoping to bring him forward into the realm of uh, media distraction and, and um, you know, relation to politics and, and news and elections and all of that lovely stuff. Um, so I think that I'm gonna just sort of leave again with that idea that it's really about student voice um, in a real way. It's about student agency, you know, empowering young people and giving them opportunity and space to create because we have to provide as, as educators and, and I'd, I'd speak to teachers you know, about this as well, that we have to provide hope um, or allow students to tap into the hope that they might actually have underneath that sort of surface, surface apathy and, and uh, you know, cynicism. You know, it's no wonder a lot of kids feel apathy right now. A lot of people of all ages feel apathy. I mean, the world is on fire, um, maybe literally as well as figuratively and out there in the, uh, the West Coast, um, but there's hope and we need to sort of activate that and work with that. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you, Ben. And Rain, I would love to hear about your work as well. Um, yes, thank you very much, Allison. Um, so just taking a little bit of notes of um, things I wanted to uh, continue to kind of emphasize is uh, what I really appreciate about the book is um, challenging you to uh, critically question, which we um, hear a lot. Um, and also as a, a juvenile justice uh, educator, um, it's extremely practical. And like Allison said, we are not um, adding any more to your plate. What uh, we hope to do is, um, is provide a, a very, um, a very um, 
seamless resource. And um, one of the aspects of the book that I um, am really excited for, um, for educators to see, use, and, and provide feedback on are specifically our call out boxes. Um, so that was something that was developed um, um, collectively. Um, and there are call out boxes. I believe there are 14 of them um, throughout the eight chapters. Um, and what I really appreciate about the, the call out boxes, um, not only allowing for the critical questioning, but also um, it takes you through um, a really scaffolded, um, uh, helping young people really to develop um, uh, self-awareness um, and um, also self-knowledge, uh, which I really appreciate. Um, and one call out box that um, is really just kind of resonating with me today, um, because when we talk about media, many people um, often um, are, are, are referring to kind of visual media, things that they can see, um, because, you know, it's easiest, I can see that, but um, we even, uh, we even dig into, in the book, excuse me, we dig into um, literacies of sound. Um, and specifically there's a call out box about um, music, how a song, um, how it, it has an, a, um, a, um, an effect on your, um, on not only your emotions, but your memories, uh, your senses. And um, I think that um, that is a, an extremely innovative and creative uh, literacy that young people may not always um, um, have awareness of, um, but uh, through this book, they'll have an opportunity to really not only explore um, uh, the creations of songs and how it affects them, but also, like I said, develop that, that self-awareness that could um, not only be used as they um, interact with media, but um, as they go through life, like a, um, a, a very um, uh, transferable skill um, in life. Um, so yeah, I wanted to call out the call out boxes for sure. I think um, educators would uh, are gonna be very excited um, to see those. Um, what I also like about the call out boxes um, are they're, they're extremely simple. Um, so you can uh, read them, most of them include questions, um, but you can really develop them into projects um, um, uh, extremely easily. Um, so taking uh, the time uh, uh, educator could build a lesson um, into a project and have uh, students um, give different presentations through decks and, and also um, other creative means. So I um, just wanted to really uh, call that out. Um, and then I wanted to also speak to, uh, Allison mentioned before about um, being able to kind of manufacture these positive experiences for young people. Um, we all go through a lot in our lives um, and we do acknowledge in the book, um, which I also appreciate that there is this kind of, um, there is this kind of unpleasant or what we might call negative side um, to media, um, but we don't leave them there. We don't, we don't drop it off there. Um, we, we are actually encourage young people um, to when they're engaging with social uh, media, excuse me, to possibly even have a, a opportunity to subvert that media um, through, um, um, through collective action, uh, which is also really exciting. So uh, I'm excited to see um, this book get into the hands of as many young people as possible and um, be a part of witnessing that, that paradigm shift. Uh, Thank thanks you. so much, Raina. Thank and to, to your point at the end there of getting this book into as many people's hands as possible, we want to make sure, especially for the educators um, and the librarians that might be watching this or participating in this right now or watching it when it gets posted um, on YouTube, we there is a partnership between um, Seven Stories Press and, and our work to make sure that we can get copies of the media and me out to librarians and teachers. This is going to start in 2023. Um, in addition to being fully aware that teachers do not have too much extra time on their plates, we know that school systems do not have much extra money in their budgets. Uh, and so we want to do what we can to support teachers, uh, to support educators, and to support librarians um, in accessing this text. So uh, while we certainly encourage you to think about supporting your local independent bookstore, uh, City Lights, of course, uh, Project Censored, we also want to think about ways in which we can support you um, and support your classrooms as well. 
Uh, Raina talked about the call out boxes. And one of the things that we brought up in the uh, opening session was also that we really end on uh, what we think of as a positive, um, as a really constructive note. And to the comment uh, in the chat, oh, it's gotten a little bit away from me here. Uh, there we go. The hope uh, is also needed in college. Um, absolutely. I think hope is needed everywhere these days, right? Uh, is that we provide a resource guide at the end. Uh, this can absolutely be utilized by individual readers. It can also be made into class projects. It could be group work, um, group activities. It could be just your own interest. Uh, we are not trying to force our readers in any way, shape, or form to do more um, or to become capital letter activists. We do um, absolutely ground our work in critical media literacy, which does have a focus on social justice. It has a focus on change making, but change making doesn't need to be a huge endeavor. Uh, change making can be uh, changing your own way of understanding, thinking, and operating in the world, right? It can be that micro local. Uh, it can certainly be your classroom. It can be your library. It can be your school, uh, but it can also just be yourself learning how to read and look at things differently. So our last chapter uh, is um, a set of uh, 10 activities, 10 things um, that, oh, excuse me, yeah, 10 things that young people can do to make change. And it can be as big or as small as they want it to. Uh, and certainly manageable. It's um, cost neutral. We're not asking people to spend money. Uh, and it can be somewhat technologically neutral too. So if folks are really not interested in adding to their digital footprint, um, or if schools maybe utilizing this are not either interested in or available to add to anybody's digital footprint. If you're at a really limited resource school, a lot of this stuff can be done analog, can be low, low tech, um, and really done in community. Um, classroom community, neighborhood community, et cetera, again, to make um, to make any level of change. Uh, so we really want to emphasize some of that practicality as well. Um, as, as I said in the opening session, we could probably keep on keeping on talking about this, but we would love to take any questions or comments, anything that we could do to support you, uh, ways in which you might want to think about how the book or parts of the book can be valuable. We did think of the book as a little bit of a um, choose your own adventure. It can certainly be read from chapter one through chapter eight, but if you want to think about just reading chapter four, go for it, right? I if do, chapter six is your thing, go for it. Raina, sorry, did you want to yeah, add to that? I, no, yes. I just wanted to also kind of double down on the, uh, on this, uh, on us doing extensive research, um, making this book youth centered, but also, um, uh, uh, through the lens of youth culture. Um, and we talked a lot about um, not talking down to youth, but talking up. And a, a big part of that for, for us was to ensure that youth seen their, uh, their cultural representation um, in, in the book and some of the examples that we use um, in a lot of the call out box activities. And I'll speak specifically to um, a portion uh, of the book that I contributed to, which is the metaverse, which I'm hearing is all the rage for the for the young people. Um, and, um, and really getting um, uh, feedback uh, from the young, young uh, folks that are closest to us. I know a lot of, uh, of the contributors say they um, had family members read it, uh, their children. I also had a young, a teenage cousin uh, to give me feedback and a lot of the, the uh, everything that they've given um, was incorporated because uh, we want young people to feel a connection to the book and not only for it to feel like homework, but for it to actually be something that they're excited about. So I wanted to make that point as well. Thanks so much, Raina. I think that is really important that we, we really mm. did rely on um, some young readers, right, as our as our first rough draft readers to make sure that we weren't pandering um, and that we were talking about what they were actually interested in in a way that they were interested in reading it. We have a question in the chat that I'll read out. Thank you for all of your work. Have you presented your work to school boards? Uh, we have not presented this particular, the media and me, to school boards uh, because 
because it's kind of brand new, right? We're just starting the conversations, the public conversations about it right now. But I think that that would be something that we would certainly not turn down. We've had some really great opportunities to talk about, um, to talk on some education podcasts and some um, critical thinking podcasts. Uh, as I mentioned, um, Ben and I and our colleague Nolan presented to the National Council of Teachers of English Conference, so we were able to get uh, to share with them. We didn't, the, the book, you know, is officially, what did you put in here? Yeah, the official release date is December 27th, uh, so um, we just had some of our advanced copies, but I think that... Um, that we would absolutely be 100% interested in working uh, with school boards and talking to teachers and administrators, et cetera, on ways in which that we could make this sort of more formally included into classrooms. Um, James writes, oh, James from Cambridge. Uh, nice to see somebody from the other side of the state. Uh, moving from activists, um, if questioning whether or not that is a helpful no nomenclature uh, to media makers, producers, and creators. Yes, that is absolutely um, one of the things that is talked about in the book. Certainly, this is something that that Mickey is really invested in. It was a, a fair amount of, of his contribution was this idea that we are not just passive media users. Uh, we are not even just intellectually active media users, but that we can work to be the media, that we can be um, media creators. Uh, and sometimes we need to use the um, the tools that we might be arguing against to some extent um, that, you know, we're out there on social media. We might be out there on Facebook or TikTok or Twitter or Instagram or so on and so forth. But what role can we have our readers think about for themselves as media creators, both analytically and productively, right? I mean, all of social media is um, populated by us as users, right? It's 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 good old fashioned us that are posting on social media. Uh, what are the implications of that when we have people posting on social media? And then also, just because this is the way our media are organized right now, doesn't mean it's the way that they need to be or should be organized. So what ways can becoming more involved helpfully potentially make some degree of change? I know I hear from my university students uh, a fair amount um, that it's this kind of shoulder shrug of like, but it's too big or what am I supposed to do? What you're supposed to do can be really tiny, right? What you're supposed to do can be, um, be a little tiny thing, right? It doesn't have to be a huge, huge thing. It's the little tiny things that can sort of start to, to add up a little bit. Um, and James writes, I call it anti-social media. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the things we mentioned in the in the opening session is that the I mean, you can you can name anything whatever you want, right? Wasn't there a time when Fox referred to itself as fair and balanced? <laughs> Great. You know, good for you, Fox, <laughs> right? We can name ourselves whatever we want. We can call it social media. That doesn't necessarily mean that it is in fact social. And yeah, it is often really isolating media, or James, as you write, anti-social media. Yeah. Um, Genevieve, Something I'm super excited to see that you're going to lend your book to the board. That's great. Follow up with whatever else we can do to help you out. I just wanted to speak to your point, Allison, as well as speaking from a student perspective as well, that um, that was, and as Rena mentioned in the beginning too, this is one of the focuses of those call out boxes as well that we put a lot is giving opportunities for students to produce, to create content that might be different from what they're seeing on their feeds, um, in mainstream media, things like that. Um, these can be, because it is a very daunting question of, uh, especially for digital natives that grow up seeing just such influxes of media of, well, it's too big. Where do I even start? And I think that's what's so great about this book is that it can give kind of a little stepping stool of ways that you can start to subvert mainstream narratives, um, things like that. Even in my own work, speaking to my thesis work, it felt almost unsatisfactory um, to do just a written manuscript. I felt that there had to be a production element in this. Um, in speaking about the media, I both felt that we had I had to use the media to also make a message. And it gets back to this thing that we've all been saying that it's an emphasis, not just on the critical aspects, but how we can use it as, um, as activists, 
gas consumers, producers, things like that. I think we need to turn it on its ear a little bit. I mean, that idea of anti-social media is that if we frame it that way to the, to the young people we're working with, we're done, right? But if we can build up to questioning whether the, whether the, the language is apt, uh, sure, sure, of course, that's really important. But I think like, why not empower young people to actually make it social if that's, if that's the goal, um, if that's their goal, because that's really what it's about. And that's why, you know, my, my word activist, like, as I said in the beginning, we can, we can bandy that about, we can unpack it, as they say, I hate that word, um, <laughs> but we can do that. And I think to do that with the students would be the powerful way to approach that. I did that in a more, um, it, I did that, I revealed that arc with them over time. I didn't say at the beginning, this is what I want to have happen. It was more like, hey, let's start looking at it. Oh, well, we're consumers and we talked about what that meant. And, and then we'd get to like starting to critique it. And then the idea of activists in my classroom when I was doing that was that it was about taking action because it's not about, like often the word activist has an ideological uh, left or right kind of slant to it, right? Um, and that's not the point, right? The point was about agency. The point was about empowering young people to go out and, and take action and have an impact on their world. And as Allison, you know, sort of the, one of Allison's motifs today, right, is that that can be a very small world that you're having an impact on. It can be just yourself and your family. It can be your community, your school, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I think to go back to that idea of it's overwhelming, where do we start? Start small, you know, and, and pick the thing that matters to you. I mean, I, I find social media can be very, very powerful and impactful and important um, on an emotional level, on an intellectual level, on a community level. I have met people on Twitter who have become friends. Um, I, I met one woman on Twitter who I started doing work with. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's a real thing. So, you know, we can, we can question those. We should question those things. It's the very point of the book, actually, right, is to question and approach all these things with skepticism. But I think that it behooves us in working with young people to allow them to come up with those labels and those reactions rather than instilling ours. So, so to, to Ben's point about kind of where to begin or how to get to an ending or, or so on and so forth, our work does not necessarily praise, but nor does it demonize the media. Uh, that Ben's point about how social media can be very powerful and it's the media are neither good nor bad right i mean they they have their problems but they have their benefits right it's what do we do with them right how do we make use of them so yes we can call and i will i have no problem with calling social media anti-social media or isolating social media i do think it kind of has the you know it it, it presents itself as the opportunity to um keep us alone, to keep us isolated. If we're scrolling through something, we don't necessarily have to do that with anybody else around. At the same time, social media has also opened up doors. There's, you know, there's a, a fair amount of research that shows that for LGBTQ youth living in um, particularly unfriendly parts of the country, parts of the country that are unfriendly to LGBTQ youth or parts of the globe that are unfriendly, social media can be a source of connection, right? It can be a way of realizing that A, you're not the only one and B, you're not a bad person um, and social media can actually potentially end some of the isolation that LGBTQ youth might feel if they are understood to be wrong or bad in their communities um, or within their families for that matter. Uh, and so it's a matter of trying to look at our media as being complex and complicated and um, having a lot of different avenues to it. And that is our work in critical media literacy is taking that distance, taking that step away and saying, let's look at this as its own multidimensional object and how we can understand it. Um, and that, you know, we're not, you know, we're not so delusional to think that if we tell young people that media are bad, that then they're suddenly just going to like listen to us because we're so stinking smart and grown up and all that kind of stuff, right? No way. 
away. Like we know that that's, that's the death knell, right? Um, but it doesn't have to be about good or bad. And it doesn't even have to be about like or dislike. It's about, are we trying to learn something? Um, and as I think we've all mentioned a little bit in different ways, part of writing this was a learning process for each of us as authors um, and each of us as contributors. And some of us do have a history of writing more academic work. Some of us have a history of writing more public work. Some of us have um, a history of more public speaking. How the heck are we going to put all of those skills into, into a book that has a pretty traditional format to it? Um, you know, it's between a cover or two book covers. It's, it's in print. It's something you're going to hold on to versus something you're going to scroll through. Uh, and the directive that we were given to look up to our young readers was a point of conversation throughout the whole drafting of this text was how do we look up to these read these future readers and also provide them information that we know is is important right we believe in evidence-based work so how do we provide how do we make sure to model that without overdoing it right so our book does have I don't know, a fair amount of citations and it has a glossary. And the idea behind that was to model that behavior of we live in a world that sometimes doesn't necessarily need to provide evidence in order to in order to be understood as true right, or as valuable when we operate mostly in a digital environment, in large part because of algorithms, we can never be faced with material with which we disagree. So we wanted to, in this somewhat traditional format of a paperback book or a library bound book, be able to walk our talk again within the pages. And so we did our research and we made sure we were backed by evidence and we shared that evidence. And our young readers did tell us that the footnotes were not distracting um, and they didn't make it feel like too overwhelming of a text the way many of us who went to grad school might have experienced. Uh, and so we really tried to, on all levels, make sure that we were doing the work to be not only responsible to the ideas, but responsible to the process that we were working through. Um, I'm seeing a whole bunch of stuff in the chat that I'm sorry, I haven't been totally close. Thank you, Mickey and City Lights, as always, for posting all the information. Um, and uh, just want to make sure that I'm not missing any questions. Um, James is, I think, I think we need to think about bringing in James for some future projects. He's got some really great one liners here. So many people can't or don't care to learn to read. Yeah, I guess we are in some ways we are a little old fashioned by by trying to be it's it's you know by trying to be forward thinking we are in fact using an old fashioned technology a good old fashioned book right. Um, but but even this even this as its own text deserves to be deserves to be taken a step away from and analyzed right what does it mean that we're trying to also share stories about this text we want people to read it right we want it to get out there we didn't want to write it just for our own you know, for the 10 of us to just have copies on our own library shelves. We really want this book to do some work. Um, we want it to be out there in the world. And that means we need to promote it and talk about it, right? So here we are doing the work ourselves, like with, in, in that capacity, we know, um, we have a pretty good idea of what it takes to understand the media. And we want to make sure that that gets shared and it's going to get shared through the media. <laughs> Um, I'm I'm cognizant of the time. Um, we've got about two minutes before our official ending. Um, any questions or comments before we sort of wrap this up? Before Peter comes back to move us on to to the what's next. Um, how about circul circulating video, James is asking. Uh, we have been doing some work that will be shared publicly. I'm not exactly sure of the time frames, but yes, we've been doing some podcast um, interviews. We've been doing some um, presentations that we've been sharing with our with our participants. This, to my knowledge, you know, at some point will be up on City Lights YouTube uh, channel. So we are really trying to get to get it out there. Uh, if any any uh, teachers are interested in doing work, if there's ways that we can support you in that, maybe through recording videos or uh, 
helping you build lessons around it, absolutely let us know. And James, to your last question here, MEF is absolutely still going in Western Massachusetts. Indeed, yes, Sut Jolly is still very actively involved running MEF uh, in Northampton. And Free Press is still absolutely, um, absolutely hard at work as well. Uh, and we are at, at least as far as I can tell, we are at five o'clock and I know folks are set up for a lot of different things today. So I do wanna make sure um, to be respectful of folks time. Um, I think we did this the last time and maybe, and I think some of you have been doing this um, as well, but if anybody needs our contact information, um, although now for some reason the chat function isn't letting me type. Hmm. Um, if there's a way, if you, it, if folks want to share their email addresses, um, I, for some reason, am not able to type in the chat function, but that's okay. I'm pretty findable at UMass Amherst. Um, but anything that we can do to help uh, spread the work, let us know. Wow. Ever grateful to you all and much respect. The deep dive into critical media literacy continues. I also want to remind you that our next session will be the midday plenary on critical pedagogy. It will begin at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern. Uh, today's event is being brought to you by City Lights in conjunction with Project Censored and the Media Revolution Collective. All City Lights events have been made possible by the support of the City Lights Foundation, continuing the legacy of our founder, the late Lawrence Ferlinghetti, into the future through public events like this one, our publishing program, and educational outreach, all dedicated to sustaining a vibrant community of readers, writers, and thinkers. So look forward to seeing you at the next session. Thank you all.